Every time I've reflected on these verses in the last few months, I found myself thinking of my old friend Josh. I remember Josh being at youth group the very first time I went, when a friend from junior high invited me to go with her. He was faithfully involved in both youth group and junior high until he graduated from high school. He came from an intentional Christian family with parents who prayed for him and were delighted by the potential they saw in him to make a mark for God in this world. He was discipled by our youth pastor. He was a leader academically and athletically. He was the kind of person you knew to respect the first time you met him, even if you were like me, an immature non-Christian showing up just for fun at a local youth group. Josh went off to a top-tier college where his very first year he somehow managed to get his own column in the school newspaper. By his senior year, he was president of the college and engaged to a dear friend of mine, a vibrant Christian with her own astounding track record of intellect, athleticism, and leadership. Somewhere along the way, he and his brother wrote a book about how to keep your faith intact when you went to a secular college. His parents felt like all their years of praying and gospel nurturing were paying off. As he graduated, he was on the cusp of entering into the world to change it with the many leadership capacities he had cultivated through the years. But before I tell you any more about Josh or share why this passage makes me think of him, let's turn to explore the passage more directly. The discourse we heard in today's reading is a follow-up to earlier events. Last Monday, you heard Chaplain Blackman speak about Jesus' controversial healing of a sick man on the Sabbath. The controversy arose not only because Jesus healed on the Sabbath, but also because he called God his own Father, making himself equal to God. The verses that follow this controversial healing, including our passage from today, are simultaneously very dense and very important. As one biblical scholar writes, seldom has Jesus packed as much important doctrine into such short compass. The doctrine of who he is, of how he is who he is, and of how we, his human followers, can know who he is. All these in less than 30 verses. We, want, we will want to go to school to this chapter for a lifetime. So what can we learn today by going to school in this section of John? We need to begin with a brief look at the verses that precede ours, in which Jesus explains more about his relationship with the Father. Here, Jesus is quick to claim his complete dependence on the Father. The Son can do nothing on his own, he says, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. Jesus goes on to talk about two specific things he and the Father do, namely give life and judge. Interestingly, and not accidentally, according to Jewish tradition, there were two works God was believed to do even on the Sabbath because they were part of God's continual saving work on behalf of his people. The work of giving life and the work of judgment. Do you see what's happening? Jesus is claiming that he's not breaking the Sabbath because he's simply doing what God has shown him how to do. And because God gives life and God offers judgment even on the Sabbath, so does God's son. As God's son, he doesn't do anything on his own. But we need to pause to remember the magnitude of this claim. This human named Jesus is maintaining before fellow humans that he has the power to give life and to judge. While rooting this in his dependence on God, he's still maintaining his claim to be equal to God. And in the process, he's rearranging the received categories. Traditionally, life-giving was associated with the beginning of life, judgment with the end of life. But now, within the one life of Jesus, these are being connected into what one commentator calls a sacred now. Life and judgment, life given, judgment removed, are the two sides of the one great transaction in John. The miraculous now of listening trust. 
this listening trust, this is how Jesus wants all of those who hear his words to respond. He wants them to respond, to believe, to receive the life he is offering. But some who have interacted with Jesus have not yet believed and received life. These listeners are the ones to whom Jesus addresses his words in today's passage. First, we hear a reprise of the main theme, I can do nothing on my own. Then Jesus begins to explore on what basis his listeners can judge his claims. He claims to be the son of the father, to associate himself with giving life and judging. How can the humans listening to this discourse possibly believe that this fellow human has this authority? To provide support, Jesus calls witnesses. This discourse has a legal dimension to it. According to Jewish law, no one person can bear witness to himself. <laughs> this is why Jesus says, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. Instead of appealing to himself as a witness, he serves as a defense attorney, calling witnesses who can attest to his claims to be the son of the father. The first witness he calls is at first glance mysterious. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know the testimony he bears about me is true. Who is this another? It's not entirely clear from the passage itself, but I'm persuaded by the scholarship I've read that this reference is to the Holy Spirit. Later in John, when Jesus promises the Holy Spirit to his disciples, he says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another, a helper, to be with you forever. And a bit later in that same discourse, Jesus says that this spirit will bear witness to him. Elsewhere in scripture, we read that the spirit is the one who bears witness to Jesus Christ. So here we can faithfully interpret this to mean that the Holy Spirit is bearing a valid witness to Jesus Christ as the Son of God. The next three witnesses are more straightforward. John the Baptist, after that Jesus' works given him by the Father, and the final witness is God the Father himself, with a special focus on the scriptures given by the Father that point to Jesus. So let's recap. Jesus claims to be the Son of God the Father, suggesting that he's equal to God. This causes some understandable outrage. As he explains this further, he claims complete and utter dependence on God. Based on this dependence, he claims to share with God the power to give life and the power to judge. Recognizing that such claims need legitimation, he calls witnesses, the Holy Spirit, John the Baptist, his own works, and God the Father. Did you notice the Trinitarian nuances within this passage? Think of three of the witnesses called the Holy Spirit, the works of the Son, and God the Father, all bearing witness that Jesus is the Son of the Father. Jesus himself, by himself, was not a valid witness. Even Jesus, the word made flesh, needed the spirit to bear witness to him. Even Jesus' works, when we get to them, aren't the key thing. Jesus doesn't point us to the works themselves, but to the works that the Father has given him to accomplish. And what is it that they bear witness to? That Jesus was sent by the Father. What I'm getting at is this. Jesus proclaims, I can do nothing on my own, and he means it. He is not a valid witness on his own, but relies on the Spirit. He did not come on his own. He was sent by the Father. He did not do his own works, but the works the Father has given him to do. He did not come in his own name, but in the name of the Father. He did not seek his own will, but the will of the Father. Jesus himself the Son of the Father, with the power to judge and to give life, lived his earthly life in complete dependence on the Father and the Holy Spirit. Reflecting on this passage, Cyril of Alexandria concluded, the Son can do nothing on his own, but does everything through the power of the Trinity. So if Jesus himself, the Son of the Father, can't do anything on his own, but does everything through the power of the Trinity, how much more do we, as beloved children of God in Christ, need to depend on the Trinity? 
Let me put that differently. It's not just that we need to depend on the Trinity. It's that this is part of the gift of receiving life in Jesus. Jesus comes to give life, as he himself says. But we need to understand he is not referring merely to a one-time transaction that gets us eternal life. He wants us to receive life in this sacred now. When he invites us into the relationship he shares with the Father, he is calling us, too, to do nothing on our own, but to do everything through the power of the Trinity. Each moment of our lives, each prayer, each act of worship, each act of service, each act of justice, every single attempt to love God and love neighbor is not done on our own, but through the power of the Trinity. This is what makes me think of my friend Josh. We left him on the cusp of graduation, of marriage, of changing the world with his tremendous kingdom capacities. He graduated. He moved into the city with his beloved bride and began, you will never guess it, mucking out horse stalls. After an illustrious year mired in the pit of horse manure, he moved into landscaping and outdoor maintenance. From the outside, it made no sense. All that potential, all those years of investment and preparation, all the hopes and dreams pinned on him by his family and his church to make a difference for God in this world. But years later, when he and I finally had the chance to sit down and talk about it, it made perfect sense. Despite all that he had learned by the grace of God as he grew up in the faith, he did not know that the life-giving gospel included living each moment of this life by the power of the Trinity. He thought it was all up to him, saved by grace, but now on his shoulders to be witnessed, to be the witness, to be the Christian leader at home and work, to enter the city as salt and light. It was more than he could bear. He didn't understand it at the time, but he buckled under all that weight. And truth be told, he's still climbing out from that pit. I understand that weight. I felt it too. Not from my family, because I was not raised in an intentional Christian home, but I was raised to succeed and to do my best. After I became a Christian, I took all that drive and energy and I channeled it toward growing in my faith and growing as a witness. That drive lasted for a few years, but it wasn't sustainable. And I had my own sort of crash after college, though not as dramatic as Josh's. It left me both exhausted and full of questions. It was only once I got to graduate school and started studying theology that I found the answer that Cyril of Alexandria had discovered 1,600 years before, the Trinity. You see, I once thought of the Christian life primarily in terms of what I do. When I accepted Christ, I focused on the prayer that I prayed and the decision I made, not understanding what Jesus is teaching through today's passage. It was the spirit bearing witness to Christ that prompted me to pray that prayer. I focused on developing my spiritual disciplines and my witness, not realizing that without the spirit, I would neither grow in grace nor be a light in this world. Discovering the Trinity was uncovering what had been true all along. This Christian life is not about what I do, but who I am as a child of God thanks to the gracious and ongoing work of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The Spirit who enables us to cry, Abba, Father, to use Paul's words, is the same Spirit on whom Jesus relied as he lived his life on this earth as the Son of the Father. This is the same Spirit on whom we get to rely today. This is part of the gift of life in Jesus that we must never forget, that we're never left on our own in this Christian life. Jesus even told his disciples, apart from me, you can do nothing. This wasn't to be received as harsh news, but as part of the good news. After all, it came from Jesus, who had already admitted that apart from the Father, he could do nothing. John the Baptist helps underscore this point. In today's passage, he's described as a burning and shining lamp. He very intentionally is not described as the light itself. As a lamp, he gave off light, but 
he's not the primary source of that light. His is a reflective light, a derivative light. We read the same conviction in the opening chapter of John. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light, this true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. It's not our own witness that gives light, but the power that comes from the true light of Jesus, made known by the Spirit. In Augustine of Hippo's words, John was only a lamp. Everyone, including the apostles and prophets, is only a lamp in comparison with Christ, who is the true light. So we are not the light, but the lamp. God may use us to bring the light, but we are dependent on his light, his life-giving light that shines in the darkness and cannot be overcome. Josh did not experience this light as life-giving. He felt it more like a millstone dragging him down after years of thinking it was up to him to bring the light. Talking to my friend and colleague at Western Seminary, Wheaton graduate Todd Billings, he noted a similar experience. He said that he arrived here with the idea that it was up to him to change the world. And he felt the weight of being part of the generation that was supposed to set things right, stop corruption, counter injustice. He has come to see that that kind of activism leads to burnout. And he encourages, encourages us instead to point to Christ and his coming kingdom, something that we cannot bring about, but that God is bringing about through his spirit. My other friend, Bethany Huang, noticed the same thing during her years working with International Justice Mission. That's what prompted us to spend years writing a book together about justice and scripture. How can our passion for justice last over a lifetime, we wondered, rather than being like a firework that explodes with intensity when we first discover the call to seek justice, but too quickly fades away? How can we seek justice right where we are, day in and day out, over the long haul? The short answer, the Trinity. As we write in our conclusion, the work of justice is hard and long. And while seeing justice accomplished brings some of the most soaring joys a follower of Christ could ever know, the journey to victory is fraught with difficulties. And more often than not, perseverance is the deciding factor. Jesus does command us to love and seek justice all throughout scripture from Genesis to Revelation, but not as frantic and reactive producers of the fruit of justice. Rather, we seek justice as bearers of the fruit he is producing. Jesus invites us to abide in him as a branch of a vine, and in so doing to allow the fruit to be born through us by the Spirit, not because of us. Today's passage from John, despite its complexity and its nuanced layers, at its heart includes the same invitation to receive life in Christ that we see throughout this gospel. My hope for you during your time here at Wheaton is that you can discover that this life-giving gospel includes living each moment of this life by the power of the Trinity, before you graduate, before you leave the strength of this community, before you face what may seem unimaginable now, buckling under the weight of living this Christian life on your own. Entering further into the grace of the Trinity right here at Wheaton is just what happened to another colleague of mine at Western Seminary. Right before she arrived here as a freshman, she had read a popular Christian book that set forth such a high vision of the Christian life that she began to have major feelings of inadequacy, wondering whether she was living up to her Christian identity. Through her courses and chapel, through friendships and community, she was drawn further into the biblical truth that our identity lies in Jesus Christ, not in our ability to seek and to do. I pray that this may be true for each one of you. That each moment here can invite you further into life with Jesus here and now. Life lived each moment by the grace and power of the Trinity. May the grace that comes through our Lord Jesus Christ, the love that is of God the Father, and the fellowship that is ours in the Holy Spirit be with you all. Mm-hmm.